We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so sure it's won it. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining us for this episode is Russell Earnshaw. We recently met up at the Mass Youth Soccer Workshop in Boston. He is a former professional rugby player and coach, heavily involved in coach education, but not the traditional form of coach education, as you're going to hear all about in this interview. Very, very different. He's consulted and delivered for Google, the English FA, Great Britain Rugby, British Triathlon, Rugby Football League, British Swimming, to name a few. Phenomenal insights on environments and the role of coaches in constructing them and interacting in them. Brilliant. Excited to hear your thoughts on this. At Gary Kernin on Instagram, at Gary Kernin on Twitter. Before we get started, a special shout out to our friends over at Sports Lab 360. If Soccer IQ is something you think your team could improve upon, stick around at the halfway point for a special offer from Nick Manzoni and the Sports Lab 360 team. Here is Rusty. Enjoy. Rusty, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Excited to have you on. Cool, mate. Thanks for having me. It's um, a little bit less salubrious than when we met in Boston, but um, hopefully uh, all's well in your world. Yeah, so let, let's kick it off with, with Boston, really, your presentation on could be one of the best topics I've ever seen, breaking the rules of coaching. Let's start there. What are these rules and, and how do they get in the way? That's a good question. Um, and, and clearly, just to signpost people, I, I, often I am the person whose job it is to be slightly disruptive and to maybe get people to step outside of their current way of thinking um, and I think a good way to do that is to maybe break the rules and maybe make some new ones. So um, I've just been reading a book called Be More Pirate. And so I'm trying to recruit more pirates. Uh, yeah, and, and it's whatever they are to you. So I think the question I asked to the people in the room was, look, what rules are currently exist in your environment that are traditions and maybe not that helpful? And if you could make some new rules, what would they be? So as an example, so... Um, uh, one rule in football is that we've got some metal men in the cupboard and we feel like we need to use them. In the same way that in rugby, we've got some tackle bags and we paid for them. And so we feel like we need to incorporate them into our training some way, even though they're not that close to the game. Um, another one might be, so we were just talking there beforehand about the RAF. So the RAF would talk about everyone has a voice. I think one of the things I noticed in sport a lot is that Hierarchy is used against people. <clears throat> so one of the guys I saw delivered talked about it was his decision to whether or not to drop some bombs in Afghanistan on some people, which is a pretty big decision. But everyone has a red card. So everyone in the room has the ability to kind of have a voice. Um, I don't see that in in sport, especially in elite sport, um, as, as much as I would probably like to. I see less stuff that's flat hierarchically where... I see lots of people that have opinions and stuff away from the coach that is different to what they say around the coach. Mm -hmm. So it might be those type of rules as an example. It might be that um, that the that the player, the, the coach leads the debrief. Why aren't the players leading the debrief? Uh, it might be that um, we always start with technical shaping. Well, why don't we start the session with a game and then work out what needs coaching and then maybe finish with a game and see how we progressed as an example. So really the question is to people, what do you think are the kind of unwritten rules or traditions in your world? And then I just invited people to break them. Obviously with your background and, and not just rugby, but you've, you've worked in a number of sports. The one thing that I wanted to get your opinion on was, I mean, you've got to have a decent grasp of cultures now. And, and obviously <clears throat> not working in the U S but coming over here and doing doing some bits with coach education. What what cultural differences do you see that shape the US and England? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And, and look, I don't think it's as simple as it looks like this here and it looks like this here. Um, what I noticed, so clearly my job as a coach is to notice stuff. So what I noticed in uh, Massachusetts was it was definitely helpful that they've almost split the between participation and competition. So the, the dinner I went to on the evening was one of the most impactful dinners I've ever been to. And it was really like the young kids, the young referees, the way they spoke about sport and the impact on their life, the way that um, Coach Epiphany stood up and said, I was told that it, this, that my one rule was don't let you be the this kid's last coach. Um, that mindset around the purpose of sport, I'm sure there was a separate dinner going on somewhere else that was, they were celebrating how many games the coaches won. And, uh, but I saw some kids giving standing ovations to coaches. I saw really positive interactions. I saw people developing as people through sport. So I can definitely see that. And the other thing, I come over to Boston every July and we do a on-pitch thing at um, actually in, uh, in Portland, Maine. And uh, I see lots of coaches come and think I'm really weird for about probably for the majority of the trip. And then come the end, they start to realise that actually the stuff I'm speaking about, which is definitely enjoyable, is definitely challenging, is definitely thinking differently about coaching. So the question I would often ask is, you know, how often do you play against a team and you don't know what they're going to do? And people go every week. And then I go, well, and how often do you train where both teams have a different scoring system and you're trying to work out the other teams? And they would look at me like I'm crazy. Um, however, this stuff is also will lead you to win more games. Now, by the way, I, I don't want so one of the <clears throat> an interesting thing, we just went to Malaysia and I coach basketball, which I have I'm quite tall. Maybe that's why they allowed me to. Um, and the kids came up with their own kind of scoring system, their own games, they gamified it. And now they're winning lots of games really easily when they weren't necessarily before. Um, so I'm then think at that stage, then what's the next disruption for this group of players? So I'm not, whilst I want people to get better and stuff, they also need to understand that winning a game by a lot isn't that useful for you either. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to disrupt yourself? How are you going to make it harder for yourself? What challenges are you going to set? So um, to rewind back to your question, um, I've been really lucky uh, in, in terms of my experiences over there. I go to Canada, I go to America. I see coaches that want to get better. Um, I'm probably hanging out with the self-selecting people. Uh, but what I would say in Boston is I've had coaches come and I've actually had coaches come and, and complain after the first day and go, well, this isn't what I signed up for. Where's the X's and O's? Um, we'll get to that. Um, I think that'll... Uh, and those coaches have then emailed me six months, a year later, and go, um, we've just won the American Championship. And we've, you know, so they've actually, and often people want success as well. So I do get that they want to see some success from, from some different coaching stuff. So I'm also mindful that, you know, in the same way, it would be the same with you. You would have delivered some stuff. You'd get some real nice feedback in the moment. And and further down the line, in a year, two years, three years, you'll have players, coaches contact you and go, okay, wow, that was that was pretty transformational. Um, I do, just don't think there's a difference. I definitely think there's some places where stuff's done well and it's 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 focused around the, the people that are being coached. And I definitely see stuff on both sides of the Atlantic where coaches' ego uh, and their behaviour gets in the way of a good learning environment. Mm, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, let's go back to this traditional thinking and challenging it. Um, we talk a lot about player intelligence in, in our coaching community in soccer, but, but I wanted to get your thoughts from, from kind of looking at it from an outside lens. Do you think traditional thinking limits our ability as a coach to be creative and to, to give inspiration to our players to, to play the game in a, in a more natural, energetic way? Yeah, look, and what do I notice? I notice that people that are producing really skillful, adaptable players who have high uh, game awareness are training in a way that creates that. So they have practice design that 
looks like the game. So, you know, let's reference your session. You were looking at a traditional rondo and actually how could we make it more relevant to the game? So the traditional rondo would have um, very low transfer in terms of things like scanning and game awareness. And is there a defender behind me versus actually how can we adapt it and make it look more like the game? So we're often uh, constrained by our practice design. We, we far too often copy and paste without understanding in my experience. So I, I, I look at rugby, New Zealand started running some kind of attacking formations, one, three, three, one, two, four, two, and people just copied it without understanding why in the same way that people would, you know, copy whoever invented the Rondo and go, well, we're going to do that because they do it and they're quite successful without seeing all the other stuff they do or the fact that they've got these players for, you know, 10 hours a day if they want them. And actually the Rondo is a very small percentage of their time. Um, the other thing that I think is a limiting factor and hopefully um, would be something that I'm trying to, I'm definitely learning more about and I'm trying to get better at and I'm trying to help people think about is, is our coaching craft. So often the challenge of moving from a drill based to a more, you know, a more games based closer to the game, tactical warfare stuff is, well, what do I do as a coach now? So how do we upskill coaches on their craft around how do they use replays? How do they give feedback? How do they work on peer to peer stuff? How do they use old way, new way as a way of, of getting people to develop their skills? So I'm trying to help people. And, and probably before all of that, spending a lot of time on and one of the things I kind of tried to divide the group up. It was an amazing place to coach in a ballroom, but it's also quite hard when there's people all over was to divide some people up and, and get them to notice some stuff. Um, and there'd be some classic stuff as coaches that, in my opinion, we could be better at noticing. So the first thing would be off the ball, um, soccer, rugby, hockey, they're all off the ball sports. Um, just asking a coach, you know, just don't look at the ball, see how long you can last is, is good feedback for how much time they spend looking at the ball. Um, another thing that I would probably try and notice more as a coach is where are people looking? Cause it clearly limits their or, or allows them to then make decisions. So in rugby, so apologies, I don't know soccer, football, as, as well as lots of other people uh, in rugby, people who've been told never to kick, they don't check the backfield or people who've been told they're a forward, they don't check the backfield. So, you know, they're not even looking there. Now, it might be a good opportunity to go forward. So I would get used to looking more at where people are looking. So as a coach, I need to think about where do I stand? So I'm always amazed with goalkeeping coaches when they stand behind goalkeepers, because clearly you'll get a view of something, but one thing you won't see is where are they looking? And probably one of the key things for a goalkeeper is what do you do before the save? Because I would imagine, and I was always last picked at school and probably put in goal, um, and I wasn't that good. Um, I would imagine that the best goalkeepers are making saves look quite easy because they've done their work beforehand. They've anticipated, they've deceived, they've thought about where am I going to make him shoot and therefore uh, I'm going to then go and save the ball there. And probably the last thing that I, I think we probably need to pay more attention to is uh, is kind of the space between players. So once we've seen something, so, you know, I'm playing against your team, Gary, and you've switched from um, from being man on to being zonal. As an example, I'm trying to use some football lingo. Uh, then who notices it? So I'm checking who's noticed it. And then I'm seeing, and how do they then share that information? And then how can we as coaches scaffold that stuff? Because so give an example of something I did in Canada. So we would play tactical games. One, I'll give you two examples of how I've done that. Uh, one team had a set of rules and the other team were trying to work it out. Okay, they were struggling. I, we then as coaches picked the player we thought was least likely to tell anyone else. And we told him all the rules of the game. So it's the classic coaching moment, have I told you? Uh, we gave him 10 minutes and he spoke to no one. And well, well, let's discuss why. Well, actually, because he's the kid that doesn't speak to anyone and he's quite low down on the power hierarchy and he's and he's quiet and he might be quite introverted. And so are other people aware that actually he has the information and how do we then share that as an example? 
Uh, I was with hockey on Monday night and we had one team and their goal was, and this would transfer to football, their goal was to get the ball back in the opposition half 20 times. They also picked the opposition player who they thought was the best player and their goal was in 10 minutes to limit that player's touches to less than five. But obviously the other team didn't know. So we played this out for about 10 minutes uh, and they were five nil up. Well, of course they were. They were getting the ball back in the up, getting the ball back high, and they were scoring. And the best player touched the ball once in ten minutes. Uh, how many people did he tell? None. Um, how many interactions did they have as a team? None. We then pulled them in, and and the team that were didn't know the rules had a huddle while the other team listened into their huddle, just to give them some awareness of how good are this team at problem solving and actually and. And did anyone notice it? And then who did they share it with type stuff? Interestingly, so the best player um, had to really be probed around how many times did you touch the ball? Once. Um, what did you do about it? Why do you think that was? He didn't actually realise he was being man-marked. He was really unaware. And these are 17, 18-year-old kids. Um, he definitely didn't tell anyone. And actually, we then needed to support him and go, well, actually, if you're being man-marked, you could go and stand next to another defender and there would be two defenders on you and we would create an So he probably needed a bit of support with solutions. So I've spoke a long time, but as an example for me, there's three things as coaches that I think we possibly don't notice enough um, in rugby. And I, 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 I've got some experiences in, in soccer, but not as many as you. We tend to focus more on the fault correction around technical stuff. Um, and, and and a real good, you know, something I've definitely picked up recently from a ski conference was using old way, new way. So instead of, you know, little Johnny struggles to, I don't know, uh, kick the ball to someone because he's, he's, he's not looking. So I'm thinking of a rugby one. He's, he's not looking at the ball. So in rugby often they'll, they'll look up, they'll, they won't know where their foot on the ball is and they'll kick it and they'll, so we might say, okay, so we're going to, the next time you kick the ball, the next three times you're going to do old way and new way is looking at the ball. So some real, it's a real good coaching skill around, uh, skill act around uh, the brain noticing difference in the old way. I'm looking up, I'm skewing it, new way, but actually going from old way to new way and agreeing with them, what's the new way? Why is it the new way? So I think as coaches, we could be A, more skillful at noticing stuff that we're currently not noticing and B, give ourselves more, um, uh, understand more ways of how we can develop skill. So old way, new way is an example. I don't see enough peer to peer feedback. So I was at a hockey session the other day and I just said, look, count how many times the goalkeepers have interactions with outfield players. Actually, you then change the scoring system. So if a goalie makes a save, it's three points. A goal's worth one point. Then suddenly the, the goalie becomes a high value player in your team. And you probably need to speak to them a little bit more. So what are the things we can shape in the game that help support some of those kind of interactions that we're looking for? Hmm. It's really, really interesting. This this traditional thinking, you know, I, I look now at what things that I've done and how I've structured cultures and environments, and I think they've been counterproductive because you want player intelligence, you want ownership, you want leadership, but at the same time, our our whole organization structure is based on the fact that we control everything. We do <laughs> the time. We do the team talk. Player knocks on the door and asks for feedback. <laughs> How do we get away from that, I suppose? Because I'm sure every coach would agree, yeah, it's probably not good for X, Y, and Z. But it's this old hands up who wants change and then hands up who wants to be changed. Uh, what, what can we do better, to, I suppose, to, to pull ourselves away from those conditioned responses or behaviors? Yeah, and look, I think, uh, I think lots of this stuff, um, I'm definitely not saying just let them go and play. I'm saying we probably need to scaffold some stuff. So if you were to say to the kids... You know, go go and do some individual skill practice. Then they might need some scaffold around what that looks like. Um, they might not, by the way. They might come up with better practices than us. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to conversations away from the pitch for me. So, a good example. So, 
<clears throat> I was at hockey the other day and they, they were put into teams and there was this this session going on and and one of the teams uh, I heard them say oh we got the best team we're going to win I was like so what are you going to do about it to challenge yourselves and they were like well I said well give me some stuff that would be useful so they actually set some challenges so their challenges were once we score a goal <clears throat> we're not allowed to score again until someone else has scored and we think we can go the whole uh, of the tournament so it's five mini matches without conceding a goal um so they had use of pause and replays and stuff so that gave them some opportunities to to maybe stop a couple of goals um so anyway so we play this session out i then start to overload teams against them i i get the referee to, to simbin them i get a i get a, a, the referee to award a penalty uh, I, I really get it to be so so tough for them and they do it actually we get to the stage where other teams were now telling everyone else. So at the start, just this team knows the information. At the end, everyone knows. So there's two games left. If the other teams are scoring two, this the, the team were going to sing a song. And they really didn't want to sing a song. They did not want to sing um, Let It Go. Uh, and so, um, so it just became this battle against these lads. And so at the end, they were just buzzing, like we did it type stuff. However, like... I was a bit, so I was pleased, but I was also like, if I didn't chat to you guys, you wouldn't have done any of this stuff. So how can we make this normal? How can you guys turn up and be, how can you own the session? How can you see the session and go and see your team and go, here's some challenges. How many of the coaches would want the players to do that? All of us. Because actually you rock up at a session and there was, there's probably four or five coaches and 50 kids. I am thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to individually coach 50 kids? No, you know, that's really tricky skill. Um, however, if they rock up and they've got some challenges and we might nudge them and go, do you, do you think you could do a few more than that type of stuff? And, and you know, and they find start to find meaning in it themselves. And, 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 and maybe we start to connect them up and actually there's some peer to peer feedback. Once again, we might need to scaffold it. So. Classic, um, another hockey center. I was, uh, uh, the coach said, like, lads, go and, um, go and give each other some positive feedback on stuff you've, you've been doing well. And, um, and I walk over and two teenage boys have stood in silence. And I said, oh, how often do you do this? They said, I think we're only doing it because you're here, Rusty. <laughs> They're pretty perceptive, these kids. Uh, and... Uh, and so, so well, let's scaffold that conversation. Let's go look, you know, Gary, what have you noticed about, you know, actually I'll go, look, Gary, I've noticed you do this really well and would be awesome, you know, in the next 10 minutes, if you could maybe try and do it. If you could do it five times, then, you know, that would be pretty cool. So we could scaffold more of those conversations. I definitely think we, we assume that when we rock up, if it's me and I'm coaching group of 20, there's one coach. I think we need to think there's possibly 21 coaches and actually how can we help them be better at owning their own feedback, giving peer to peer feedback, noticing, changing the rules of the game, setting challenges, you know, and, and those are the players we'll pick. <clears throat> so think of the best players you've coached and, and I think of the best players I've coached and they would have those skills. Um, now, often by accident because i'm like you i look back and and i wouldn't want to share many coaching sessions from more than i don't know a week ago uh because they're terrible um but 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 you know we could be much more intentional with that stuff so the thing so the thing that i'll take home from the um from boston more than anything else is so i created three co-coaching cards because i wanted to demonstrate how we could co-coach i had three co-coaching cards and i said to the coaches you know any volunteers who wants to come and co-coach which is quite a brave thing to do and the kid said could we be co-coaches rusty so so i said cool so reese so i gave reese the card that was head of happiness so reese's job was to catch people doing stuff well and to fist bump them or high five them and um which was cool because actually it was quite nerve wracking for the kids as you would have seen you know when you were coaching and there's hundred and odd coaches watching it's in a ballroom it's quite hard for the kids so uh so reese goes off on his little mission his secret mission uh 
And, and then we just have a chat about, well, what was the impact of that? Did anyone notice what Reese was doing? Oh, I didn't notice. Cool. Anyone have uh, anyone that made them feel good about stuff? Oh, yeah, Reese got, oh, right. That's what Reese was doing. So I was, my silly assumption was that the co coaches were going to be the coaches. Um, clearly, that's a, a rule I need to break. Um, the players were, you know, and, and, and I think it's easier with the younger players. So at no stage is an 18 year old teenage boy turned around to me and gone, Rusty, can I coach? Whereas a nine year old kid has gone, well, why not? What's the, I haven't got the tradition stuff yet, Rusty, so I'll have a go at it. Um, so I think that's something else we should think about is how are we going to do peer to peer? How are we going to, you know, because we would all, you know, and I don't know enough about how successful you were at football, Gary, but I would imagine you would have been more successful if you knew back then what you know now as a coach. Yeah. Uh, me too. And so, you know, that whole experience with Reese, and once again, I'm I'm not just letting him go. I'm actually checking and going, is he doing it? Does he need some support? So I did say, do you need do you need a hand with this, Reese? You cool with it? <clears throat> because it had some clues on the card anyway around catch them doing stuff well, maybe a fist bump or a high five. I said, do you need a hand with it? Do you need any help with it? And he was like, no, no, no. I said, cool, we'll just, I'll, you know, if I need to check in with you, I'll check in with you on it. But he was actually fine with it. Now, clearly, I'm, my job as a coach is to check in and go, look, mate, do you, do you need a bit of help type stuff? Um, but that was amazing. I mean, if that if I take one thing from Boston that I learned as a coach, it's that, yeah, I'm assuming the wrong thing about who the co-coaches could be. You use these cards then. I think this is really cool to to basically provoke a little bit of thinking with the coach or to challenge them out of their comfort zone whenever you go into an environment. Yeah. So, I mean, look, we, we designed these. I'm pretty proud of them, definitely. We've just done some business ones as well. And they're really to, in a playful way, to facilitate some conversations. So I describe them as... I put a deck of cards together that's 20 years of my mistakes. And this will hopefully help you not make as many mistakes as I did. So it might be as an example, one of the cards is um, uh, explore giving feedback in four different ways. So back in the day, Rusty thought there was only one way to give feedback and it was me to tell you what you were doing wrong. And, and that's the rules of coaching. Uh, I since discovered there was other ways of doing it. Um, and so, what I just do with the coaches is I just throw the cards out on the floor and go, look, pick one that you think you're doing really well. So I would want to definitely recognize what people are doing well and what their strengths are. And we need to build on that. And I want them to be authentic and then pick one that would stretch you a little bit as a coach and actually have a think about how you might do that and, and why, or maybe also, and the other one I said is if you co-coach with anyone and you think they do something well, then give them that as well. Cause the reality is we, we probably like the peer-to-peer -peer stuff <clears throat> more than the 44-year-old man from Middlesbrough rocks up for a, for a couple of days in Boston and then goes home. So um, <clears throat> I've played around with it. I've done it in lots of different ways. I try and make it playful. So <clears throat> Worcestershire cricket, we had a starter, <clears throat> a main and a dessert. So the starter was your pre-session card. Your main was the one you were going to do in and your dessert was how you did your feedback. So as an example, someone picked starter um ask two players how they want their feedback today the main was a uh, recreate a famous scenario from your sport and the uh after was um uh get feedback without warning on on your coaching language so it was it then just knitted neatly into the session so they asked the kids they actually quite like the ipad stuff they recreated the a famous uh I think it was Shane Warren Berling against Mike Gatting. They put it on and they did that. And then they got some feedback on their coaching at the end of the session that was useful for them as well. Um, so I'm just trying to, you know, in a playful way, disrupt people's thinking. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, I don't know, hundred and odd cards. They're, they're pretty, they're, they're pretty cool. There's some before, during, after there's some stuff in meetings. So a couple that would benefit Rusty, uh, reduce your slides by 50%. I almost had a heart attack when I did a day at Google and they said, we are slide free. Sorry, what? In an hour, I'm slide free. I've got like 200 slides perfectly manicured. Um, another one that would be really useful for me is um, get some feedback and check in with a co-coach. So often I can run a session 
and probably not be mindful enough of my co-coaches. And the last one that I, I really like is that it's around a reflection. It gives me quite a nice framework. I, re, um, I really appreciate it. I struggled with, I discovered, I wish I had. So actually to have a conversation with me, players, coaches, and actually just go, look, here's some stuff I'd like to share. Because once again, if we want them to get better, if we, we, we expect them to be vulnerable and trying to get better. And then we possibly need to model that better than we currently do. Often coaches, you know, hierarchically the king or queen, and they know everything and we never get stuff wrong. I think it's, um, I might have, uh, one of the stories I tell is I was did a school inset and I said, um, how many of you deliberately make mistakes when you're teaching or coaching? And one lady puts her hand up and she says, actually, Rusty, it started out that I just wasn't that good a teacher. But uh, I actually now deliberately make five mistakes every lesson. If they guess them at the end of the lesson, they go one nil up. If they don't, I go one nil up. And there's a prize at the end of the week. And I won't swear, but she said they concentrate a hell of a lot. Um, so that's kind of counterintuitive. But for me, that's a really interesting way of being vulnerable, of checking whether or not they understand or they're listening. Uh, I'm making it playful and you know the, the kids are doing really well in their stuff and of course they are because that's pretty cool teaching we'll just take a quick break here for those of you who have tuned in to a previous podcast you may have heard that modern soccer coach have teamed up with sports lab 360 to produce an entire library of session plans that has just been added to their platform so in addition to the platform being a tool to help your players increase their soccer IQ as well as address tactical areas of development, the platform now provides you with over 60 session plans from myself and Modern Soccer Coach to go and address those areas of development. The time it has never been better. Through February, Sports Lab 360 is offering Modern Soccer Coach podcast listeners a season subscription for one team at a flat rate of only $200. Whether you're involved at high school or club, it's a tool for all coaches to consider affordable, effective, and you'll notice a huge difference in the level of game understanding amongst your players, as well as their ability to understand the instructions you provide them. So don't waste any time. Go online, sportslab360.com. Reach out to them. Tell them Gary sent you to get your team hooked up for this whole spring season. Back to Rusty. Let's talk about you know what we talked about before we start recording. That was these these cultures and, and disrupting these cultures and disrupting how people think in these cultures a role that again most people would say that's what i need that's what we need in this organization club program but then this is my belief rusty we've we've got this picture of culture that we've got this great book that allows us to pick the people and take the people off but at what stage does the people that you kick off just the people that you don't agree with and the people that you value, the people that you do agree with, and it becomes a case of groupthink. I want to get your thoughts on that there. How do organizations and clubs have a culture, a real culture of disruption uh, that's healthy? And how can a, a coach absolutely be a part of that? It's a great uh, question. I just wrote some notes down there. Uh, I think we've got to celebrate it. So I think we've got to value, you know, that's a, that's a that's a great mistake to help me learn. I, Eddie Jones, uh, I heard him say once, you know, we're making all the right mistakes to do well this weekend. So I think I, I quite like. So you got to think about your language. I've also got to be mindful that people tend to ask me or visit me because they're already part way down there. So I've had a couple of breakthroughs this week with two of my most challenging coaches, and actually, the 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 solution was co coaching. Was actually. What I also is probably another tradition tradition around coach development is either you watch me or I watch you and actually collaborating. I've had two real nice collaborations this week that have been awesome and I've learned lots as well. The other stuff I wrote down with, I would tend to follow the energy. So if you've got an organization and there's some people that are excited about it, then don't spend too much time with the other people because it annoys the people that are excited and it definitely takes away all your energy. But also be mindful that I need to spend time with people not like me as well, just to check and challenge myself and doing a podcast tomorrow with Jamie Taylor. He's not like me. I'm a little bit nervous, but that's cool. I'm excited because I learn lots. Um, 
how do I kind of frame it with the coaches? I often try and give them choice. <clears throat> so putting the cards out gives them choice. They've immediately something I'm good at and then something that's a bit of a stretch. <clears throat> so I can then start to see where they are individually. I think a killer question is important. So, you know, watch off the ball, put your hand up as soon as you've looked at the ball. No one gets beyond 20 seconds. Um, I often give them the choice as well. So um, I did a couple of days with football clubs last year and because I only had one day booked in with them to start with, I was like, I've got nothing to lose. So I'm going to give you the choice. We can either be pink and fluffy or we can deep dive around reflection. It